Uh, welcome. My name is uh, Kapil Surlakar. I work at LinkedIn here. I lead the data analytics infrastructure team. Uh, and I'm really excited to have uh, you know, our wonderful panel members and all of you uh, here at LinkedIn, uh, at LinkedIn today for this, um, what is going to be a very exciting discussion on a really interesting topic uh, on, on, on machine learning. Now, as many of you might know, LinkedIn itself has uh, a very rich portfolio of data products that we have on the site, right? And um, this includes things like uh, people you may know, other recommendation products like recommendations for our jobs, companies, groups for uh, that we suggest to our members, uh, search products, uh, you know, other uh, uh, advertisements, and and so on. And most of these data products have machine learning and data science at its core, right? In fact, uh, it'll be hard pressed to find uh, a data product that that isn't. But developing a lot of these rich data products, and especially having them in production and at and in large scale, uh, takes a lot more than just development of machine learning algorithms, right? And often uh, the bottleneck in development of these products end to end is also a human factor, right? Now my job at LinkedIn is not to uh, do machine learning or build a lot of these data products, but my job is rather to keep the people who work on those problems, the data scientists and other developers who do that work, uh, the, my job is to basically keep them happy, right? So uh, for a lot of us, the focus is basically on how do we improve the developer agility, productivity, and, and happiness. Um, so what does it uh, take to develop a data product like that end to end, right? Uh, it needs a lot of complex technologies for it to come together and work seamlessly end to end. Right. First and foremost is the problem of ETLing the data from the online LinkedIn.com and a variety of external data sources. Right. And um, the massive volumes of this data and the variety of the sources and the complexity associated with them makes this ETL problem a very challenging one. Right. And it's extremely important to make sure that uh, uh, we ensure the data quality of the sources because uh, a lot of the computation that follows on these data sets uh, really depends on the data quality, right? Because without that, it's just garbage in, garbage out. And uh, for a lot of the machine learning algorithms itself, uh, they run on what we call derived data sets that require a lot of complex computation to be performed on these data sets that are ETLed into uh, you know, what we call data warehouse or you know, like the cool kids call it a data lake or whatever you want, right? And it's important to, it's really important to understand the data lineage behind these derived data sets and to have a framework by which you can do easy data discovery uh, on, on this democratized and very fast moving data ecosystem, right? Uh, now a lot of this data preparation that is involved on these data sets often involve massive computation, often very complex computation, including joints, graph analytics, and all, all kinds of stuff, um, in order to get these data sets ready for, for, the, for the machine learning processes, right? And um, the next set of problems is uh, the data set themselves are often changing very quickly. And it's important to have frameworks that will then automatically retrain your models when the data sets uh, uh, change. And uh, the final piece of the puzzle is how do you deploy uh, the results of these models and the artifacts that you've generated back into online systems uh, to the site for serving back, um, back to the site. And often uh, these might be just simple serving of the results back to the site or might involve further uh, OLAP serving style which require further, uh, further um, drill down and slice and dice use cases, right? So, um, so in, with, again, to develop these end-to-end -end, uh, data products in a, in a data ecosystem like ours, uh, the focus always has to be on how do we make the developers agile and productive, right? And to, with that in mind, uh, we at LinkedIn, uh, a lot of teams have invested uh, to build a time in order to build a lot of systems that focus on different parts of this problem. For example, we built a platform that works on ingestion of this data and the data quality uh, at scale, a platform to do very complex uh, computations on platforms like Hadoop and Spark, uh, in, and including graph processing. 
uh, a framework to um, evaluate, train, and deploy the machine learning models and do automatic retraining when the data set changes, um, and uh, platforms to do uh, some of these complex calculations, serve it back to the site, uh, platforms for OLAP serving, and also platforms to support all these uh, data discovery lineage on all the other uh, things that the developer needs, right? So a lot of these systems are already, some of these are already open source. A lot of these are going to be open source later this year. So it's going to be uh, quite exciting. So anyway, with that, I'll hand over the mic to uh, Pashu now to introduce our panel and get the discussion started. So thank you all again for coming here and looking forward to an exciting discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kapil, and thank you so much, LinkedIn, for hosting us tonight. Um, my name is Pashu. I'm uh, with The Hive. And a quick survey, who have heard about The Hive before in the room? Nice, great. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I'm going to say a few words about The Hive Think Tank. Um, so The Hive Think Tank is a community of practitioners, data scientists, designers, engineers, artists all focused around big data and you are part of this community. We have over 5,000 members now. Uh, we hosted over 60 events in the la last 18 months uh, and had over 150 speakers. Those are our upcoming two events. So we are launching our startup series next week at HP uh, with Alistair Quirl from O'Reilly Media and he's going to do a great presentation and he's going to sign his latest book, I think it's his fourth book, uh, called Lean Analytics. And on September 3rd, we'll have a professor from Stanford talking about big data and clinical and bioscience science applications. So make sure to register. We'd like to thank our sponsors tonight as well as our partners. And we'd like to thank, of course, LinkedIn for hosting us. And uh, make sure to um, continue the conversation online while you are here. You can tweet, use the hashtag HiveData. We can, you can also follow us on Facebook. We have lots of great f uh, fun pictures and uh, cool things to look at. And we have a newsletter as well. So make sure to check us out on social media. And I'm going to pass the microphone to TM Ravi, who is the founder of The Hive. Uh, have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you, Pashu. So it's, it's amazing to see uh, such a great crowd, of course, attracted by these great uh, panelists. And uh, thank you also to LinkedIn, our friends, for hosting us. So just uh, briefly, who's The Hive? So The Hive um, incubates, funds, launches companies in the, in the data space. Uh, we typically are, are involved at the seed stage, put, you know, put a million and a half to three million dollars. Um, our focus is in three areas, enterprise, online, IoT. Um, and so we do not focus on infrastructure. Uh, we are best friends with Mapper and, and a whole bunch of other people, but we are not trying to create companies that are going to kill MongoDB or something like that. <laughs> um, uh, there's a whole bunch of companies that we have found uh, that we have uh, helped start, and and so you'll see uh, companies in the advertising space, retail analytics, security, um, Internet of Things, um, uh, application development, retargeting, and so on and so forth. Um, we are hiring, <laughs> and and so Foghorn is a company in the Internet of Things space. Uh, s and fog is this concept of a mini micro cloud that's close to, um, you know, in the factory, in the home, in the car. And, and so we are looking for some people there as well as in one of our security companies. So if you're interested, please reach out to us. Um, be a part of the conversation tonight. Uh, if you tweet, use the hashtag HiveData, otherwise no one will know that you tweeted. And so, with with that, um, I'd love to, I'd like to uh, welcome um, this great uh, set of panelists, and I'll I'll hand it off. So so we have uh, Avery from Facebook, and Zing pardon my mispronunciation, Zingroy from Databricks, Nahum from PayPal, Ted from uh, Mapar, 
and three from Hex Data. And with that, I'll hand it over to Avery. Thanks for to LinkedIn for hosting this great event again, and for the Hive for organizi organizing and bringing it together. I think the one person that doesn't get credit here, though, is Shri, actually, who came with the idea for this panel. And so he's the one who put it together. Uh, we have a great set of panelists um, from industry. Uh, and we'll begin the evening by uh, having everyone talk a, bit, a little bit about uh, what they're working on and uh, what the companies are working on, uh, beginning with uh, Shari from Databricks. And then what we'll do after that is uh, we'll have a very uh, interesting panel discussion. Um, where I'm just moderating, I'm not speaking actually. I'll let these guys do all the talking. Uh, and finally, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So with that, um, Xiang Rui. Okay. So uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Xiang Rui, and I'm a software engineer at Databricks. And the project I'm working on is a Spark ML lib. I'm a Spark committer, and currently I spend most of my time on just maintaining the ML lib project. And before Databricks, I was here at LinkedIn. So I was a proud LinkedIn graduate a lot of friends here. And I also have a PhD from Stanford, but this is not in the chronological order. I, I won't tell you which one comes first. <laughs> so for the project, uh, is, uh, the Spark project actually is the most active open source project in the Hadoop ecosystem right now. And it's even more popular than the Hadoop MapReduce. And so we have uh, more than 200 contributors contributing and more than 50 companies contributing to this project. And for the functionality we provide, we provide a, a Python interface, R interface, uh, even SQL, Java, Scala interface across many components like GraphX, and Spark SQL, and also MLlib and streaming on top of the Spark Core component. That's the Spark uh, project. And then the project I'm currently working on is MLlib. It's a component of Spark and focusing on scalable machine learning. And um, so the initial contribution was from Berkeley Amplab, the same group of people who created Spark. And it was sh just shipped with Spark since last year. But since then, we already have more than 60 contributors contributing to this MLlib project. So it's a very active machine learning project. And, and for Databricks, the company was just founded by the creators of Spark. We tried to just make Spark uh, more popular in the big data world. And for ourselves, uh, we have a product called uh, Databricks Cloud. It's essentially, well, now so a lot of data are uh, living inside in the cloud. We also want to deliver the, your job scripts and your libraries to the cloud as well. It's something like an a interactive notebook. And you can just open your browser and just uh, run some scripts and interactively uh, just try to extract value from your data. It's very easy for collaboration. It's very easy to share your, what you're finding from the data. Yeah, that's the, OK. Thank you. And let me see. Now there's no data break, so how do I get to the next one? Uh, can someone just switch? I have no idea. Oh, it's coming. OK. OK, here we go. So <clears throat> basically, I am, am I the only one who doesn't sell products here? Uh, no, I guess you don't. OK, so what I want to tell you is, uh, so I thought that instead of that, I'll give you a little selfie of uh, data and big data at PayPal, which is part of eBay Inc., which even has more data. And I am, uh, my name is Nahum Shaham. Don't try to pronounce it. And I'm a principal data scientist, and I'm leading um, a team of data scientists at PayPal. And we have uh, plenty of things to do. So let me talk to you. And my, one of my style is to put very austere presentations, as in Geeky. And at PayPal, we have, think it or not, it's a data company, any way you look at it. We have big data ecosystem. Start with a lot of data, transaction and users, and just like you know, click stream. The whole thing you have it in in masses. At total uh, PayPal, eBay, we have double digit petabyte of data that is analyzable. And so, even in today's frames, 
it is a lot of data. We also, in order to host and to analyze them, we have very large uh, analytic platform, including uh, very large Hadoop clusters, and I'll talk about this Teradata, one of the biggest ever made. And we have a lot of areas that are dedicated to analyze the data. We are analyzing in risk. We have merchants. We have uh, markets, marketeers. We have consumers. We have products to analyze. And we have a lot of big system in order to do an analysis of big system. Each and every one of this is, uh, is a whole area that you can apply machine learning and statistics and testing, the whole nine yard. And one unique thing about it, that each and every one of these, because of our environment, has a readily available ROI to measure your model against. And the way I emphasize, usually the ROIs have a number that has a dollar sign to, its le to the left of it. So you have to go and this, and some of my comments you will see, it's all about the big question is, of the, people think data science, you know, analyzing data, machine learning. The question that the customer asks is, where is the money? <laughs> this whole thing is in order for company to improve their performance, and company performance is measuring money anyway you look at it. And, um, and we also have an analytic-ready business unit. So if you come, you have, they know how to appreciate the impact of good big data algorithm throughout. So this is the, the environment, the big data environment. And uh, we are doing quite a bit of things. Risk analysis is done in a big way. Fraud. Uh, everybody wants to go to PayPal and get something for nothing. A lot, not everybody, a lot. <laughs> I, heard, I heard recently a statistics how many of the login attempts are, fo are frauds, and I don't want to repeat that number. <laughs> so we have a lot of fend off to do. We also have commerce graph. We have plenty of merchants and consumers. So you want to do graph, uh, iGraph, we use it. Uh, appreciate the uh, contribution. And uh, we also identify trends in social media. Because what I say is, if we miss in the risk, we lose money. Our false positive has a cost of PR in social media. As in someone write, PayPal froze my account and all of this. And it become a big deal. So there are different <laughs> things to think about. What is the cost of your model? So we have this. Um, this is just a sample of the areas that are done. We have very big systems. On the left is uh, Teradata. We have multiple Verizon. On the right is Hadoop. Uh, and so in Hadoop, we have just about anything you want to throw in Hadoop and its ecosystem is there. And in uh, Teradata, we have SQL and something also called, we work with Teradata to do things that replicate, at least replicate more non RDBMS, we call it SQL++, which is text analysis that actually parse text and deliver it in comma-separated big strings so you can analyze it later to analyze click streams. And so just for you to know, we are also investing in building big systems. Those are some of the big systems, the standard EDW and a special one. I just show this just for the geeky touch of it. It's Singularity, which is Teradata, that it's much lower cost and can host much more data on it. And of course, we have a dupe, as, as I said. And uh, one more thing. Yeah. <laughs> so there was, usually I have an ax to grind in all my presentations. So we are hiring data scientists and everybody who knows how to spell data. So, my name is Ted Dunning. I'm Chief Application Architect with MapR. What we do is build the highest performance, large scale data processing clusters on the planet. They run Hadoop. They run much more than just Hadoop. We run 
data processing for large data at the largest credit card uh, company in the world, the largest telecom manufacturing system in the world, the largest retailer in the world. Basically, the biggest and the best pick MAPAR. The reasons that, we, that they do that is because we provide an unparalleled quality and performance combination. But what I'd really like to talk about right now, I mean, that's pretty cool stuff. I can talk for hours and hours about that. Of course, this other stuff I can't talk about sitting down. But what about data processing? What about scalable machine learning? What I contend is that we've forgotten more in the last three years about where we were than any of us quite realize. Uh, I worked on neural nets many years ago. I worked on graph theoretic processing systems a decade ago. I've worked on fraud systems, on recommendation systems. And over and over again, what we see is the one pattern of people think that revolutions happen, but in fact, it's rediscoveries. And people think that they know what's about to happen because they say, see, we're repeating history, and they're completely wrong. So you see this, this, this contradiction here. We see people saying that machine learning has to be extremely complicated. And indeed, I've built a system that I had to work with all kinds of symmetries and transformations because the data we had available at launch was 12 data points, not big data. That made it extremely hard to analyze that data and get useful numbers out of it. More commonly now, we have things like 12 petabytes of data. And that's changed fundamentally the algorithms that we need to work with. Many of the algorithms that we work with come down to counting. That's often the hardest part of these algorithms. And I see that this, this revolution in Outlook from knowing the data exquisitely and analyzing it every which way from Sunday to the problem is the data, not the algorithm, as a transformation which is going to accelerate. We're going to have more and more troubles just with the logistics and the pragmatics of the data and less and less troubles with the subtleties of the mathematics. I think that that's becoming simpler and simpler and we're becoming more and more counting. But that's my view of the way that machine learning and scalable machine learning is going. We need to find these things, and we find ourselves more and more in a world of Washington data that is being generated by all of us. We all have a cell phone. We, we walk around in a store. That generates data. We, we walk past cameras. Uh, that generates data. We drive cars. That's generating data. We fly in airplanes. Everywhere, we're generating more and more of this data and making the more, world more and more perspicuous for automated analysis. But an awful lot of that comes down to easy stuff. And I promised tonight to plug the hive, so from now on, I'm anonymous. <laughs> These are hive glasses, of course. As you can tell, thanks for gathering today. As you can tell, there's a real um, riot ahead of us. We have some really crazy good personalities. Um, by the way, Avery didn't mention uh, his giraffe, which was showed up in PayPal slide, is one of the uh, one of an inspiration when we were getting started. So, um, thanks for thanks for gathering. Thanks, Pashu and uh, the Hive Data for putting this together. Um, phenomenal work. Ideas are cheap. Execution is really hard, as as some will say. They executed it. Um, I'm here uh, because of H2O. It's an in-memory, scalable, open-source machine learning library that you guys can and a platform um, and that you should definitely try and use. There's only one big slide here. Time is the only non-renewable resource. When I started the company, I was asking several people, about 80 different customers, how long does it take to run your analysis? And four to five hours was the common answer we got from everybody, whether it's big data, small data, all of them. And, and actually, I started it right somewhere here in LinkedIn's free Wi-Fi. Um, it was even LinkedIn had five hours at the time. The answer was after four to five hours, nobody cares. So it doesn't matter how much data you have. And what uh, Ted uh, said is absolutely true. Counting is the most common uh, big data algorithm that's run across the board. So, so it's your time. And that's why speed matters. And that's why scalability and speed. If Google took five minutes for every search, we would not be here today. 
Um, data science starts with data. So there's at least three, two big panelists here with real data. And LinkedIn itself has data. And every one of us has have data. And um, it's our data. So it's actually it's about time that we need our own algos and our own open source algorithms to take charge of our own analysis. Um, so algorithms matter. And that's one of the reasons uh, we are open source. Um, and that's one of the reasons we actually want it to be a community effort. And that's we've only used mostly meetups as a way to both, um, both build a product, build a company, take the word of the product. Uh, we've released our product at meetups. So we've done about 90 different meetups in the last one year. And that's um, almost one or two every week. This is why I'm here, because of the team. There's a couple of them in the audience. Um, Arno and Ray, I see if others. Uh, I see Ariel in the audience as well. Um, but the team behind this company is the reason why this product is amazing. Um, any, I mean, any one of those five people could come on stage and still do a very good job at talking about this product and talking on the panel. So it's, it's, it's really a very good team. So join us or use us. Uh, the team's back. It's a systems team building algorithms with the help of mathematicians. So we kind of really are taking the mathematician's work as our uh, result, reason, reason DHA and make that uh, a real application, real software. So you see Stephen Boyd, Rob Tipshirani, Trevor Hayes. And, um, but what, what you don't see there is actually the community, which has helped us build the product, and the community of customers, community of users, community of uh, critiques and, and feedback. So it's been a very feedback-driven company so far. Um, so that's the other slide there. Um, it's beginning to be part of curriculum of several schools. MIT is beginning to offer a program on it. Stanford did one. Princeton has picked up a few. Um, California State University has it part of cur curriculum. So over the next few years, uh, John Chambers gave a word out at the USR conference. This could be one of the future for R, because we have real, um, we, we install as a simple R package. Here's a uh, kind of the product with all of its um, glory. Has lots of it's in memory, highly compressed and fast. Right, that's kind of the core. It's extensible. Um, here's one thing we're doing. Um, we want to actually make sparkling water. So, so our next uh, upcoming interesting uh, series of meetups, you'll see, we're bringing Spark API on top of H2O. Sparks, as um, as uh, Shangru mentioned, and uh, Mate. I mean, Mate is one of my uh, favorite persons to work with when I was getting started. Mostly he's genius at bu building elegant APIs. So uh, an elegant API with the speed and power of H2O, I think that's, that'll be a powerful combination for, for the community. It's open source. We want to make sure um, the best of breed open source wins. As you can see, PayPal still has a ton of um, uh, proprietary hardware and software. We want to slowly, one by one, get at that, that places. And the only way to do that is to the best of breed open source. So this dev in the, in the land of open source means you can actually give the best of breed. And that's all I had to say. And uh, hopefully, we'll have a fantastic um, evening today. Great. <laughs> Thank you. So I thought we'd open this discussion by actually asking the audience a question. Um, how many of you think you need scale? You have problems that require scalable machine learning. Honestly, yeah. So that's like maybe a third or so. So two thirds of this audience doesn't believe they actually have problems that are relevant to what we're talking about here, right? Um, <laughs> and I'll just—I guess I'll start by posing this question, maybe at uh, Shang Rui. Um, you know, why do we need scalable machine learning? I mean, if I just filter my data down enough, I can just train on a single machine. Isn't that good enough? Most of the time, I mean, there's not like linear benefits by training with more data necessarily. The speed benefit, is it worth the complexity, for instance, of having multiple machines and the, the chances of failure increasing and things like that? And then I'd love everyone to jump in. Uh, after. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting. So my thesis work actually is I prove something like uh, you have uh, billions of observations, and I show you you only need to sample 10,000 of them. And then to get a very good accuracy with maybe 99.99 .99, well, success rate. That's my thesis work. But then after that, I moved to LinkedIn and I saw this big data problem. I think that's a different thing. It's a, maybe people use uh, this single machine solvers to solve a problem. They feel it's very natural. 
But when we talk about this end-to-end -end pipeline, and I think about the, the machine learning part is uh, just a, a single component right, in this pipeline. And now you want to, for other parts, they already will do everything on top of MapReduce or on, on Spark. And then when you talk to uh, reach machine learning part, the step, and you want to switch to a single machine, actually that increases the complexity in your pipeline. And you need to have a team that can uh, design some scheduling software that can give you different kind of resources. And then you can have this a single machine to train your model. Also, is think about how to just uh, move a lot, huge amount of data into a single machine. But for um, many users, and they use a single machine solver because they are more familiar with that. And also, uh, there maybe their lack of uh, scalable implementation of this algorithm. And that's also true. But really, is, I'm thinking about when you try to fit machine learning into this end-to-end -end data pipeline, you need to think how to use this, uh, the same set of machine, the same set of cluster to solve machine learning problems for you. That's my thought. Yeah, I'd love to uh, comment on that. So first of all, small has gotten really big. So already we see a scaling that's happened, which just has changed people's perceptions of what scalable means. But there is a user interface question there, which gets much, much simpler if the boundaries of a single machine are in no way privileged. If scaling up and scaling down are very natural operations, and you don't have to worry about that boundary, you have a much, much easier life. I'd also like to point out that if you're going to sample 10,000 elements cleverly, uh, you mm -hmm. didn't sample stupidly, otherwise you wouldn't have <laughs> yeah, gotten it's, the, uh, it's smart the PhD. Sampling. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this isn't just any kind of sampling, it's smart sampling. But in order to sample from those billions and billions of data points, that is a big data problem. So it isn't, as you say, machine learning that becomes scalable, but the entire pipeline has to still become scalable. You have to find those nuggets of the wonderfully informative data points. That means you have to look at everything. So there's still scalability, even if these people say, no, not so much. I think they've already scaled without themselves noticing because small got big. And secondly, they're drawing a circle that's kind of small. They're saying, yeah, the scalable part's over here, but it's not the machine learning. Eh, it's all the same. It's all pragmatically data processing. Mm -hmm. I guess the question, follow-on question would be, how many of you use the cloud? Or you think you use the cloud? Right? And you'll see a lot more hands go up. And that's kind of the, kind of the, um, the basis of this whole piece, is sampling is hard, and really hard. And there are some algorithms that actually do get better with big data. So as you keep adding more of your inbox to that machine learning, something can remove spam from my inbox that's already using machine learning at scale. Yeah. So. But what I think is there are some problems. I'm looking for the, there is a historical statement that where quantity transforms into quality. So it was done in a totally different context, and I kind of see it in this. So there are some problems where inherently you need the big data and they are not what they call embarrassingly paralyzable. For example, uh, the classical one by now is the Google throwing a huge amount of untagged images so as to identify the content, I mean the cat, okay? So they are not tagged. And basically what they talk, not that I'm part of this in any shape, but they talk about this, that you can throw a lot of unlabeled data and get the performance of supervised learning. So those are the things that inherently we are going toward them. I mean, uh, 13 years ago, uh, uh, Eric Brill, who then was at, um, at Microsoft, later became the VP search research for eBay. Basically, he showed he did a lot of uh, NLP, and he showed how different algorithms perform as you throw more and more textual data in them. I think the context was in finding misspelled or misconstrued things. He showed that the best algorithm on half a million words performs the worst when you throw three order of magnitude data on it. And those are not easily parallelizable. Very simple algorithm to Ted's point. Very simple algorithm performs really, really the worst 
at a small amount of air, all of a sudden perform the best when you give it humongous. So those are not easy, uh, easily um, sampleable, if there is a word like this, because you have to have the huge amount of data to have enough, enough sample for even the rarest of the words. So it's not easy to sample them, and they require all of this. So I think we are going in this way. And also it was mentioned here, the data movement is extremely important. OK, so you have uh, five petabytes of data, and you want to analyze it, like, I don't know, uh, several thousand segments around the world. Every segment you can do it either separately, or you want the interrelation between the geographical segment. What are you going to do? You analyze each one of them separately. You move the data around, and things of that sort. So you have to look at it in a comprehensive way between the data movement and the data analysis. And was said, I think, Ted, you said that in order to analyze data on a single machine, you move the, have to move the data to that machine. And trust me, data movement, oh, you said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, both OK, sides. sorry, the <laughs> reference is yours. So, and I fully agree, because moving data is one of the hardest problem in, in all of this data science and machine learning and whatever. I mean, you have to get it, you have to move it. Very hard. It's a lot of large numbers. Is there any concrete data you guys can give to back that up? So, uh, like so the law of large numbers. Yeah, there is. I mean, look at the paper from Eric Brill, 1981. Not, not papers, in production. So like no, maybe you, for you, ROI. Did your ROI increase by scaling your machine learning model by you know, 100 I data? I am not at liberty to tell how much it increased, <laughs> but we yeah. measure them in dollars. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that... Uh, work on large-scale machine learning with a new platform, et cetera, dollars were measured. Yeah. And I, so I, this yeah, is, yeah, but I cannot, I, I, I I cannot actual numbers divulge yeah. numbers here. Yeah, so one of the startups I worked on failed. And therefore, I can tell stories about what happened <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody can complain. Uh, but what happened is we, I'm going to de-anonymize here, too, because I just can't see anything. Uh, the, uh, recommendation engine that we'd built was very cleverly built to fit within the confines of one machine. And as a result, as we grew, and, and we were growing very fast, we were doubling traffic every week for six weeks, which in the third week is not so bad, but the fifth week is beginning to be quite strenuous and worrisome. And what we found is that this clever algorithm had to get cleverer and cleverer and cleverer, we were doing all of our work just to keep it alive, and it was handling a shorter and shorter horizon of data. It could only handle, by the time we scrapped it, five or six days of data. And it was very clever. We had spent a lot of effort on it. We flipped over to a big data mentality, started using multiple machines, suddenly the runtime got less, and we could work on, instead of like, a few hundred million observations. We could work on 200 billion observations. The answers got better, and our lives got enormously better because it was so much easier to think about. It was a matter of, did these occur together or not? Did that matter? OK, we're done. And, and that simplicity was such a breath of fresh air. That, and and it, it meant that we could experiment in ways, instead of just maintain we could move forward, and we developed things that categorically changed our business and our traffic. We became the second most sticky video site as a result of those changes. And so, yeah, there were very, very real consequences, not just in that one system, but because in all the other systems we were able to go make better in the spare time we had from not having to do complex things. Writing a check scales time-wise quite well. Just add a zero hardly takes any time. So you might as well do more stupid stuff. That often pays off more than doing enormously more intellectual effort, as sad as that is to say. I mean, all those people with PhDs, it's too bad. 10 times more stupid is often better than twice as much smart. Uh, but, but that's the way it is. So you have to be clever by being stupid. So we have customers. Um, who can now see 10, 20% better performance, predictive performance with big data. So this is actually not a, uh, it's reasonably empirical. You can actually see it. And like that's a, a sign change, isn't it? Yeah. 
because their competitors <laughs> will do huge. that if they don't. Yes, it's huge. Uh, and it's not, and then boosting the ensemble's recent developments in math has definitely got, that gets better with big data. So you can actually, some of these algorithms are learning with data, and so that's actually like, makes them thrive. Um, and at some point, the data is so large that correlations are not too far off from causality. So you really are seeing that lot of large numbers um, actually work for, for our customers, for, for, big, for scalable. And I, uh, something that um, Ted mentioned that jumps off, uh, rips off that is, it's sometimes the simple is, I mean, this big data is not necessarily a number of rows. It's the number of features, right? So you have high dimensional data. And as you keep adding dimensions, which could be like locality, lo where did you drive from, to where did you park, or what car you drive, what color of the car, where all the various sub-features that you historically did not even care about seem to have impact on your um, analysis. And so the high dimensionality is another uh, scale that we're seeing that customers and users are, can take advantage of. So I think uh, definitely um, scalable machine learning or even fast machine learning or fast analytics is here to stay. And fast was not, big is not super big, by the way. Um, Microsoft Excel did not have X number of rows up until recently. Until the year 2000, you couldn't have a million rows. 65,000 was just like your limit. So, and R, it still has a lot of um, community. It doesn't really do, do a lot of justice for your analysis. You're waiting for days, and I was waiting for days before I said, no, this is not worth waiting for days. So. Great. Let's, um, okay, hopefully everyone's convinced now. So let's uh, move on to another part. You know, as a software engineer, when I think of machine learning, I get really excited. I start thinking about all these interesting scalable algorithms I'm gonna write. But let's get real here, right? Anyone who works in machine learning today, most people aren't working on the algorithms. Very, very few people, I mean, in the audience, if you're working machine learning, you're, you're most likely not working the algorithm yourself. You're not, uh, you're most likely working on um, productionizing things, f feature engineering. Um, so one of the questions I think is, and I'm gonna pose this first at Ted. Um, you know, what about the productionizing aspects of machine learning? How do you build pipelines and workflow? And this is something that Shang Ri brought up earlier. It's, all, it's about the whole pipeline process. And machine learning is just really one step mm -hmm. in the whole pipeline building process. You know, how do we build workflows and pipelines that you know, inter integrate machine learning? How do we do, you know, record experiments, do parameter sweeps? These are things that normal people to do who are doing machine learning on a day-to-day -day basis. Be able to share these results with others. And what, what is your basic vision for what a full-fledged machine learning platform looks like. <clears throat> and then I, I would love to hear from everybody else as well. I'm finding that the, the classic grid sweep sort of approach where you have a, a static data set uh, and you, you try different learning algorithms and you have a static performance and analytic that goes against that <coughs> is more and more not what's actually required in a system. And the reason I say that is because more and more of these analytical systems are not just telling us answers, they're taking action. Mm -hmm. And the moment that their action selects their own training data, then they become a part of the game and no static <coughs> analysis ever again will really drive the, the comparison correctly. And so we see algorithms where if you add noise and demonstrably <coughs> make a recommendation worse, it can explore more, and the first day will be worse, the second day will be better. So you would, on a static analysis, eliminate that algorithm, mm -hmm. and yet it's far superior. Or you'll see situations where a bad algorithm running next to a good algorithm, they will co-evolve, the bad algorithm will feed the good algorithm better training data, and it will now perform astonishingly well. So these, these systems become far, far more complex than static pipelines really do any justice to. And we have to start moving toward very fluid decision making in real time, very fluid ability to field thousand systems live against the data at any given moment. Not just run a thousand systems in the back office, but run them live now mm -hmm. and start looking at decisions that they're making. Try to mitigate risk in those cases but also allow exploration. And that's, to my mind, the serious challenge, is how to bring these out of the static pipelines and into the real world. 
very difficult problem and unsolved, I think. Mm -hmm. Oscar, comment? Yeah, you know, I, words to say about EDA. Yeah, let me, so. because I'm working in all of this, <laughs> and uh, so basically the way I look at it is the whole, you need to work on the whole stream, stream, a whole pipe of data from the point of generation. A lot of time, the, the data is generated in your site. You have, I don't know how many thousands of servers, and they all generate data, and they come to the data, and you want to make decision as soon as possible to be more relevant. So you need to go, and you need to ingest the data, and, uh, and do all the cleansing and everything that is needed and run. You, usually when people say uh, machine learning, they kind of implicitly say about the training of the model. A humongous part of it is the actually scoring. You need to score in real time, and a lot of companies, PayPal included, has SLA on the scoring. You come with a transaction, you have a very strict SLA, by the time you have to decide this is a good one or this is a fraud, I mean, you, you can't wait for, you know, I don't know how many seconds. So this force you to simplify the scoring part of it, the result of it. A story that I read again, Urban Legend, I haven't heard it from uh, Netflix itself, is that they did not actually use that algorithm that won the million dollar prize because it was too complex. So you need at the end of the day to work on things that will deliver it in, in time because time is of the essence here. Another thing that in all this and people kind of not emphasize it large enough, uh, strong enough, is what happened after you actually let the algorithm work in, in real life? Who collects the data? Who Past the judgment, I mean, Ted talked about automatically feeding each other a lot of time. People are involved in this. People say A-B testing, fair enough, you do A-B testing. What do you do with the information? How do you feed it back in order to improve your algorithm? It's not always automatic. And so all of these things, the learning and basically the idea, and again, I'll harp on my ROI, I mean, you did all of this work, did it matter to the company? What's the impact on the company? Because this is the one who actually invested in that. So all of this need to be looked at from a holistic point of view. And that's kind of what we learned from working with customers or bringing it early into the market was the first thing was I need to, this is a great boosting model or a great deep learning model. I need to put it in production. Where is the scoring engine for this? So one of the things that we actually had to create as a side effect was scoring engine that like, literally produces the Java code that runs nanoseconds for a decision with no data allocation at all in each of these, uh, each of these lines and create the scoring engine that goes into production. But if you, step one, if you go one step back, um, I mean, the applications are creating the data. So the data is actually, I mean, is it, the needle is in your hand when the application created the data. You had the full context of the data. And creating really good online learning um, like algorithms, streaming algorithms, which some of the new stuff that's happening in the space um, is kind of one of the future um, directions that most of our customers are headed. And the other thing that Nahum um, sometimes reminds us um, pretty strongly is that the running the algorithms is just like going to the prom, right? The pr actual preparation for the prom is much larger. How do you prepare your data? How do you kind of... talk about what happened after the problem. <laughs> 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 he didn't talk about that. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> that's for later. That's, uh, different. that's a different kind of score. Okay. That's a different kind of scoring. We want to <laughs> talk about the EDA. Mm -hmm. And munging of data is actually quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of um, work. It's 60 to 80% of most of data science work. And I think that's where traditional MapReduce comes to play. That's where a lot of the Hadoop tools have uh, really, like, really flourished. Hive still is the number one ingest path for us. We get data after Hive is, you run your query in Hive, that's when you pull the data out. Uh, R helps a little. So we, we, we have R as a language and uh, that can give you some kind of uh, ability to munge each of these columns and change them or transform them. But I think there's a bunch of work that needs to happen before 
the algo gets to be even run. So. Also, I think uh, there are also other challenges in uh, before machine learning in this pipeline. When you prepare your data, and also you need to make sure the entire pipeline can be rerun accurately. It's because uh, data changes uh, along this time, you need to update your model uh, to make to reflect the, those changes. But things happens a lot. Uh, just uh, changes happens a lot in every component in this pipeline. For example, if your uh, data of the initial well event log format changed, and you miss some feature columns, but you use the old model to make prediction, and it, they doesn't uh, they don't match each other, so you get some wrong prediction. So you need to make sure you can rerun the entire pipeline frequently and to evaluate the entire pipeline frequently, that's also a challenge. So you'd say that essentially uh, version control on data is a very yeah. important thing. Not mm -hmm. just moving data, but freezing data. Yeah. So you have mm -hmm. reference data to work with. Right. Do we have systems like that today? <laughs> Would you like to talk a little bit about what, what you what you I'd like? love to. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, th I think that real time is a very, very seductive thing, and it's very, very valuable in an ROI sense. But then very often, if it's just real time, it's moving all the time, you can't ever pin it down and get repeatable engineering processes out of it. With one of the things that we do well is the ability to freeze entire large volumes of data petabyte of data, take a snapshot, transactionally correct, frozen in time. From that, you can have a reference data set. And you can take several of those over time. You can say, yeah, I ran on this, I ran on that, I ran on that. And suddenly, I see a change in performance here. And now you can actually go in, because the data is sitting still, even though it's still flowing on the non-real-time, non-frozen version. That's one of the key things that we offer to machine learning. It's completely not a machine learning thing. It's completely not a real-time thing. It's exactly the opposite of both of those. It's purely pragmatic, purely freezing the data. And yet it has huge implication to engineering work with machine learning. So one of the things, um, one of the things our team is building is um, how does DevOps for the data science environment platforms look like? Right? What is the DevOps equivalent for taking uh, a model but not only training the model on a particular data set, sometimes you munch the data set while you're modeling it. Suddenly you just expanded as factored one column, right? just made it a big large enum or categorical, and now your historical models on that particular data is no longer valid. So you need to build a completely new family of models. And once you build these models, you're taking them to production, and maybe you autopiloted them to production even, suddenly it has a high false positive rate or and then suddenly it summons ROIs like under danger, right? So how do you now undeploy this and redeploy the previous night's model? Or how do you hot deploy a model in production? I think these are the questions that customers are beginning to think about. The whole space is evolving around it. And we have a product that's the kind of meta product around the core H2O that can help uh, there. But clearly, that's kind of the next phase evolving around this. So uh, next question, um, what's the right interface for machine learning? So there's lots of ways we can do it. Uh, there's R. There's through the web, UIs that we are available. We have Java interfaces. We have machine learning building blocks uh, where you can, platforms you can build machine on top of, like Spark or, or, Ma or MapReduce. Um, I mean, this kind of posed a question, like, what, are, what do you see the most traction being made in this area of interfacing? Uh, with developers or users even? As, as a user, as a working bee, because we are in the hive, uh, if you're, t I mean, there are several ways you can look at it. One of them is this for the scientists to go and experiment with algorithms, do interactive analysis, etc. This is one thing. If you want for the interface for production, how you actually automate, this will be another thing what APIs. But for my point of interacting with it, uh, I would say for R is by far, and that's my personal, but I would like to see eventually something like uh, speech understanding. You go and tell that, uh, run me an algorithm, and uh, give it some specific, as in if you believe the ads for Siri, something like this. And it will tell you, hey, you know, you forgot these features, etc. cetera. This I would like to see, but it's not, it's not here yet. 
Until then, R is the wonderful interface, and thanks for H2O for adding that interface to theirs, and I know that um, Spark has it, and you, you have R, right? Yeah, In we Spark, have Spark R package. Have. And so almost everyone now has R, which is a wonderful interface to do it, and so you ask which one is the best, so I gave you that. You know, but when you talk about a user interface, you have to talk about which users. Mm -hmm. And everybody in this room and everybody you know are users of machine learning. Every time you do a credit card transaction, you're using machine learning. Every time you make a phone call, you're using forms of machine learning. And so there are many audiences. And in between the scientist and the mathematician and the actual consumer, there are different audiences. You said the word DevOps. You talked about production. Those are audiences, too. And it's very, very easy to retreat from that interface with consumers and start talking about things like R and developing the models. But you yourself said that's a tiny part of it. There's much bigger parts of it. And we have to remember that as these systems take more and more action, they shape the world. They are not just interfaces. They are world shakers. And they are changing things. Well, certainly recently, uh, uh, or at least a big foo about changing the world without an institutional review part uh, doing too much about it. Uh, and, and, but that, that responsibility is real. And, and that is probably the bigger interface for machine learning. And I think one that we need to pay at least as much attention to. What, what is this system doing? Um, I mean, R is definitely a leading community. Katie Nuggets, um, Gregory, he publishes R versus Python versus different SAS and other libraries. And Python is definitely one of the fast-growing um, API as well. And we're coming out with an API for that um, in, in the next year. Some of our, some of the, there's a lot of crossover happening. Machine learning um, or data science is kind of the two paths for data science, one headed towards the business analyst, which is much more UX, web, and um, JavaScript UX that gets much more simpler, beautiful. How do you transform more closer to voice recognition, but one step less. For now, pretty good pictures, Tableau, plus plus. Um, but I think one other direction is uh, developers. I think there's a huge, uh, if you see the whole movement, why is this room full? It's not full of um, just PhDs from Stanford and Berkeley. It's actually full with developers once they want to get their hands dirty. And if you think about MLlib, it's attracted a very good portion of the developer momentum into machine learning. And that we see a lot of that's happening. Java is a good API. Uh, Weka never did very well, but if it did, then we would have had a good Java machine learning. H2O is one of them now, Mahout. Um, so for a, for, a, for a long part, I would say there's a different, there's a, ecosystem of different languages that we see flourish. I think REST APIs, that's kind of where we stabilized around, is going to power most of these services. There's going to be APIs eventually. Uh, segment my customers by who is likely to close in the next three quarters. I mean, I want that, right? So everybody wants to know, segment the movies that released in the last month that I forgot to watch. So things like that, and I think that's kind of more higher level uh, pieces to machine learning that can come and help us automate our, um, our kind of the simpler li parts of the life. There is, there is another segment, and this is a very critical segment. Uh, those are the um, business consumer of the machine learning. The business people who actually, you need to convince them this is a better algorithm than we had before, and they need not necessarily take your word for it, and this part of interface, what are the metrics, the number, the chart that you saw someone probably has some basics in statistics and know some of the buzzwords, how you can convince them to put yet another invest investment to change their system, to change their process, the algorithm. You have to come up, here is my case for this new algorithm. This is why this is better than we have right now. And those are the things, and I have to give credit to H2O, that they have uh, very nice, like, 
especially when you run over a grid of hyperparameter, et cetera, and you have, I don't know how many different models and different model families to select from, and then you decide on one or a combination of two, you have to come up with a metric to show this is why this one is the best. AUC, F1, well, whatever you want to call the metric, but you have to show them they should understand what this is. And at the end of the day, some of those that order that are marketing people. They want to take the algorithm and go and do some marketing action. And they have to, to know that they will actually get the results that they hope with that, rather than just doing some basic heuristics. I think I, uh, I can add more categories into this to distinguish those users. And some users, they just want to use machine learning service. I want to do recommendation. I gave you the user ID, and you give me the items, right? I don't care about what kind of algorithm you want. This is the perfect interface I'm expecting. And then there are some uh, maybe data scientists or data engineers, they want to use machine learning as part of their pipeline. They don't want to tune a lot of parameters, right? They want to just be automatically tuned. Oh, just uh, let the default works generally well on uh, most of cases, that's good enough. And then there are some people, developers with machine learning background, and they know how to tune them, and they know how to, how to uh, evaluate those algorithms, and they, don't, they want to have the freedom to do it. And then just a, uh, one level down, there will be machine learning developers who develop machine learning algorithms. And now this is, I think at this stage, is very different from traditional uh, machine learning algorithm development. It's on a parallel platform and incre increase the complexity of this uh, algorithm development. You need to think about communication. You need to think about fault tolerance. And then most of machine learning developers, they don't really have this system background. So it's hard to talk with the system. It's hard to deal with, the, for example, the MPI calls. It's very easy to get that lock. And then it's, it's, uh, it's very nice if the system engineers can create a good layer between system engineers and machine learning uh, developers, and then they can talk easily and do not know, well, what is happening underlying this system, uh, this layer about the system. That would be really nice for machine learning developers. And that those are the categories I'm thinking about. We did that once uh, in a company I worked with, ID Analytics. We had a system that the mathematicians could build models there would be a representation of the model that they thought was the truth. They could run it, and it would be very debuggable and very understandable. But when you took that same description into a production setting, it would build the code very differently, and it would be very productionized, very high throughput, much less easy to understand, much more pipelined. And it looked like the same thing, and people thought very different things about it. It was like the classic elephant. People had the tail or the trunk or whatever. And, but it was the same artifact that moved across, and it was a very reliable way to move that. That turned out to be one of our keys to success there, is the fact that we could move from abstract, simple development, but not productionized, to full production use in less than a week. Uh, and at that time, financial models normally took six months to move out. So that was a huge advantage. And I hear now from friends at Apple that they need to be able to deploy new fraud models in hours because the frauds will shift that quickly. So the, the need has become even more exigent than before. Was the job done by the same group of people or two groups of people? There were three groups. Three groups. Okay. So there were the analysts, there were the software developers, and then the ops team. And each had a very different view of the system and each needed to have a very different view of the system. But it also had to be the same thing in some sense. You had to have some way to guarantee bit-for-bit -bit equivalence in a different operational yeah. regime as we moved across that. And that was the real success. I hear that that system has been pirated all through that part of the finance communities because mm -hmm. of that ability. Yeah. So H2O, kind of, and the premise behind H2O was exactly that, that data scientists will not write MapReduce. That was literally our one of our punch lines. They will not write MapReduce, they will not even write Java, I mean, to some extent. That's kind of a limitation we kind of ap apply to ourselves. And we said, let's build the machine learning GLM. It has to be speak like R. And people can write to us in R, and that's a boundary, and then they can 
the code that gets jittered to actually get run at high scale and high speed, that's completely like, a, like in, the almost obfuscated for the end user. And so that's kind of why it's a systems engineering team that kind of tried to work with mathematicians. Um, and I think what, what you're finding is that more and more now you're seeing people who want to tweak the algorithm for their domain. Um, domain specific algorithms are kind of the next phase and that's kind of where we'll see um, people getting their hands dirty. Sounds like what you're saying is that good fences make good neighbors. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I think I can tell a story about if, well, if how hard it is if people speak different languages. It's a, I have a paper submission, and then the editor feedback is, for this line of code, can you remove the semicolon, replace it with a period? That's a, <laughs> that's a MATLAB code. It's a, I, told, I told them, well, no, it's a, it doesn't work that way. So it has to be a semicolon. <laughs> One interface we did like, I did like, was um, the Wolfram's um, predictive interface. Um, they're trying to kind of almost abstract away all the way to math um, and let you write in math and good things will be created at the back end, of course, that never fully finished. But as an, as an interface, I mean, Stephen does have the right ideas on how to complete, how to think for the end user. And that's something that um, would be worth um, emulating. The web UI is definitely interesting. People want repeatable T, though. So if you can create a script behind the web UI and then, re and then productionalizes, that's something that we see. So. Um, let's talk about maybe a different area, which is, um, I mean, there's a lot of, and the hot topics today in machine learning is uh, deep neural networks and GPU training. Um, is that stuff useful? What do you What do you think? Or ensemble training, even? Uh, what's the What are the thoughts from the panel? Does anyone here need to get their hands on uh, NVIDIA Tesla and fire up a uh, torch? The The version that I like about it is that uh, this deep learning allows you to do things not better, but you cannot do otherwise. As in the, or not otherwise in any reasonable amount of time. And so between doing things better or doing things you cannot do otherwise, I think this is where the deep learning is. Also, it has its own challenges. You know, I come from different backgrounds. I like to see sorted out theory <laughs> and that uh, rather than just, but you know, you put everything in the pot and mix well, and all of a sudden something works. Okay, <laughs> can't argue with success. But um, so this is, I think, the big promise of, of, um, of deep learning and the GPU basically is that allows you to do it if you master the language and, and the hardware, et cetera, to do things in very short, much shorter amount of time at uh, two orders of magnitude less cost, which is, again, part of the sound that quantity makes quality there. If you can master that uh, CUDA thing. And um, so this is as per Deep learning, the way I looked at Ensemble, is basically to make your algorithm more robust. I mean, it should not uh, respond to all kind of noisy environment, less respond to noisy environment. Make it more stable, more robust, without having to tune each and every piece of the data or the parameters, etc. as in, I don't know, random forest, for example. Uh, I think that uh, some of these tendencies toward fancy hardware are a bit of a uh, chasing a mirage. They, they are difficult to do. And I think that there is often an attraction for doing the hard thing. We've all been taught that that's what's virtuous. And again, uh, I think that it may be worthwhile for a lot of people just to do more stupid stuff and use simpler techniques. Uh, and if you look at it just by kind of a sense of balance, an engineer costs you several hundred thousand dollars a year, it's plausible to have that roughly that order of magnitude of hardware available for them to work. And if you're going to cut that, call it a, you know, a $200,000 worth of, 
hardware cluster dedicated to each engineer doing this kind of work, if you're going to cut that by 10x, that's a false economy to me. You probably are over-optimizing. Now, if you were to cut something that's $20 million down to $200,000, I think that's probably a very fine economy if that's one person monopolizing that, that large amount of thing. But if we're talking about cutting tens of thousands of dollars against a several hundred thousand dollar a year cost down to a few thousand, then I think it is completely a false economy. And uh, it may be interesting, but it's probably not worthwhile. And in many cases, it doesn't actually hit the problem you need, which is the data prep anyway. So I'm, I'm very dubious of that. I'm also very encouraged by the performance of just ordinary processors lately. It, the difficulty of producing good CUDA code that's well aligned, that you can actually move the data in and out, that means that these other guys can make more algorithmic revolutions per unit of time, and they're, they're difficult to catch if you can only move slowly. I think for me, uh, I think GPU is not attached to deep learning, right? GPU can do many useful things, especially doing this matrix matrix multiplication much faster than CPU. That means if we construct, a, uh, uh, implement our algorithms correctly, we can actually use GPUs on traditional machine learning algorithms. For example, if we do multimodal training, we can embed multiple uh, runs into a single iteration and then do this matrix matrix multiplication. This is where GPU uh, really works really well. But the problem with GPU is still, well, in this pipeline, you, you have all CPU instances. And now you say, at this step, I want to switch to GPU instances. It's not that easy to switch. And that's one problem with uh, GPU right now. And the other thing is with deep learning, and my understanding is that this is, this is not magic. This is not something you throw in uh, some random data set. It will show you something useful. Right, you still need to learn this system. Uh, for me, it's a, just an optimization problem with multiple layers. And you need to learn how to tune them. But it looks to me it's not a well-formed optimization problem because it has so many parameters. And then it runs about maybe two days to run, to train a model. And before, you have to wait for two days to see well, whether you can see the cat face from the output. And but for some, for certain problems, it certainly worked. It has already been proved by many times. But still, I think for the big data applications, uh, people still need to do something stupid, just like Tess mentioned that. Try to think about, rather to trust those magic words, maybe try to think about how to extract useful features from your data, because you understand your data most and you should be able to extract some useful features from it. And use traditional algorithms and well, well known and well understood. And then it's very easy, also very easy for scoring, for online serving. So That's my, yeah. So finish. Yeah, finish. I'd like to be stacked against all the panelists here. Um, we gave deep learning to a few customers. They didn't want even to go back to GBM. It's, once it's 94 or 95% accurate, People are willing to cut a finger for that. Forget GPUs, they'll do whatever. Um, because now you're able to predict much better. So the 10% better accuracy or the next best algorithm on the planet is worth it, right? And there are two big dif differences from, when I first saw Jeff Hinton's book in 1991, I actually stole it. <laughs> I actually, ha I mean, I have it in my office. <laughs> It's, uh, it's really, it was groundbreaking, the PDP book, right? So Paul Smolensky um, wrote the first MLP paper, and I was like brain turning. So I immediately coded it down. And on a peer risk at the time, I was happy to be running on a risk system. Um, but it never stabilized. So it worked very, very, for a very limited bandwidth of, of um, problems, it, it worked. But it never stabilized. And the advancements in deep learning from then to now, but 20 years later, is exactly that. And we, st we sit a stone's throw away from that same great man working on the Google Brain project. And um, it's, it's really mind shattering because now across very different domains, you can see 
deep learning actually work? And, and the whole hack that he came up with is very simple. Adaptive learning of the weights just stabilize the entire algorithm. And the two things happening. One, of course, that algorithm change. But the second big thing is better CPUs, better memory. It can actually run faster. And big data. So more data actually does help information theory to converge. So as a result, these optimization problems with lots of layers are actually, actually working. So we're seeing people predict like lifetime of a roof. And these are people in the Midwest, big old-fashioned insurance companies, right? So, so to eBay itself, which once we started gave them, giving them classification algorithms using deep learning, arguably after we did a little bit feature extraction using word to um, that performance was like about 10% better. So once it's a little a leap above, 10% in that, in that space, about almost an order of magnitude better, they were, they're not willing to go back. In fact, the second problem that we are seeing in this space is, of course, that um, so one thing is true. Shangru has a real point. There are lots of parameters. There's L1 regularization. There's um, which um, should I use cross entropy or what loss function to use. There's some learning to be done. And up until Tiano was really hard to use. And so once we made that easier to use, we are seeing most of our customers actually from logistic regression to GBM to go into deep learning. And it's, a, it's not just hype. Uh, some of them are actually like applying and seeing better results. They, they're, it's just as easy. And one of the things we've, we are also seeing is the performance has dropped. So in other words, speed has like caught up. So with four hours, we have a world record open source algorithm that's able to do it. I'm pretty sure if you apply GPUs, you can get under the 10x uh, on that same performance. And we've actually had uh, a, a someone from um, working with one of the hardware vendors on site the other day just translating it to run it faster. And once it becomes really close to real time or near real time, which is seconds from 40 minutes to like four or five seconds, you suddenly have people using the best of the algorithms. And that's when you want kind of a system that does run all of them and just tell me I'll get my coffee, right? And usually that's coffee time. But if, you, if it, all of that is done for you on a cloud or quickly and fast, then you really don't care at some point if the, if the test versus train results work well if put it in production and the scoring engine does reasonably well, and the whole cycle can be done within half an hour or 40 minutes, you, you actually can try a lot of different algos. And the best one wins. And it's not, um, we're, we're definitely dealing with a very intelligent audience, right? Intelligent audience of users. They can quickly do the full cycle and say, hey, this works or not. So, so we are seeing some reasonable adoption for deep learning. Actually. If I could slice the GPUs away from the deep learning also a little bit more. Another trend that we see in big data is not just depth, not just number of rows, but number of features. We often very ha have very, very large, sparse feature sets. Hundreds of millions are not that uncommon. And GPUs are, uh, the technical term for this is they're crap at that. Uh, they just don't work very well. They do very well on dense multiplications up to a very modest size, a few thousand. But for sparse problems, they just don't deal and for billions of rows, they just don't deal with it well. And so I, I find, yeah, that, 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 that's very good in specialized per situations. Gaming, they, they're, they're absolute dominant. But as you move more and more toward pragmatic machine learning, I find them less interesting. And the reason I really want to peel those apart is because I think deep learning actually has legs. It really is doing some very interesting things. And we need to. Uh, to, to separate that from those two things. I mean, from a GPU standpoint, um, programming is definitely harder, right? But we are seeing some young startups, the new start, new wave of startups, just start with GPUs, start with CUDA. It's a little painful, but they get started, they work with it, and um, rebuild some of these algos there. Um, it's faster, it's commodity, but that just means that Intel's next wave of algos may just, next wave of hardware will just embrace it and plug it into the core chip. So some, some such interesting change and it'll be commodity again in the same hardware. So I think purpose-built hardware has always um, kind of had taken uh, a second step, but we are seeing a tremendous um, uh, pull from the market about GPUs and um, it's not um, just a few advanced
companies, a lot of people are doing Well, an that. AMD's processor where they unify the memory spaces might be a step in that direction toward right. commoditization of that style of processor. Is the man from Intel, I think, is laughing. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've got a, I'm got out of questions, um, and it's getting a little bit late, so I'd love for our audience to just step up to the microphone uh, and feel free to ask the panelists uh, almost anything. The man didn't just step to the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so immediately. So uh, the question is, uh, in, you know, talking about the scalability, you know, you're referring to the uh, fact that you have to move the data from place to place, which consumes a lot of time. So my question is, from the infrastructure point of view, for all these, did you guys think about, or are you maybe already doing it, especially with Facebook and LinkedIn? So what about bringing the process to the data rather than bringing the data to the process? And especially across the van, I'm, I'm, I'm more interested in um, you, know, you guys talking about how you guys are solving the problem across the data centers, across the van. And uh, rather than uh, and anything beyond that, so so that you you can you don't have to move the data from place to place. I think that process mobility is just a given. I think that's why nobody mentioned it. It's just an absolute axiomatic feature of any scalable system. Would I mean? I see a lot of nods up here, uh, and I think the distributed hierarchical systems where you have di geographically distributed uh, satellite processing that breathes in to a central site breathes out back to operational sites is also at scale a fairly much a given. I guess LinkedIn was one of the systems that ran with just a very few data centers longer than most places have, but almost everybody has many global data centers at, at very large scale. So I think that what you say would have been controversial or questionable five, ten years ago, but is is absolutely correct now and completely accepted. So I can I can give a, uh, as a follow-on question. So for instance, Hive, Hive as in uh, on the Hadoop, it's, it doesn't scale beyond. I believe it doesn't scale beyond data center. In other words, Facebook mm. tried to do a, a scalable Hive across the data centers, and then if you go to the uh, internet now and look, look for that open source, it says the project is abandoned. Yeah, the reason why the project is abandoned in open source is because we've uh, we forked Hive internally. So we got it working for us. <laughs> <laughs> but yes. So that so so in that sense, you we are do have across data data centers. We have a pretty we have a way of replicating data like with table imports um, from one data center to another. We have multiple meta stores, and yeah, we we have to manage. We can't f we have to manage across multiple data centers with with the scale that we have. But so, that, that yeah. sounds like you're moving data rather than executing a single hive query across. We don't execute data. a single hive query across multiple data centers. And I don't think any of our customers do either, even though many of them have multiple data centers. They, they build their system hierarchically. They use mirrors and other transport mechanisms to move uh, partial aggregates, partial results to uh, sites, then finish off the queries in, in that way. But according to that abandoned um, <laughs> website, they do run the joins across the data centers. Actually, what we do is we, we move partitions around. So you can import a partition from one data center to another as a one-time thing, as a recurring thing, that just whenever the partition is generated, it's automatically copied over. And we also basically allow, um, we kind of allow compute to move as well. So. Basically, every team in Facebook kind of has something we call a namespace. And this is something that's integrated not just with Hive, and, but our underlying MapReduce implementation as well. And uh, your compute, your namespace has a set of pools with it. These pools can exist in any data center. But this is something kind of transparent to the user itself, actually. So you'll just run your compute. You'll do your Hive query. It may run in whatever data center you don't really know. Uh, and we, this gives us the ability to then move data as we need according to the compute and, and storage resources of any available data center that we have, which we, we, we really need this feature, actually. That's an interesting point. Um, most of our customers still want joins, for example, across big data. And um, some of the things we actually don't do, right? We, don't, we do group buys, we do small joins, maybe, but real big joins. People want big 
big data, big joints, and uh, across two big giant multi-dimensional tables. And I think that's a, still a missing piece in kind of um, open source in many ways. And um, it's kind of, um, one of, we're kind of hoping someone will pick it up, finish it off. Um, Spark SQL potentially could help there. Um, we, we really, I mean, I mean, the SQL side of the house is, I mean, I, and you guys do some of that. Um, yeah, Drill is beginning to, yeah. one of the test cases is a uh, multi-billion by multi-billion row joins. Uh, and those are, those are a key use case. Yeah. Those are beyond memory size joins. Yeah. So I think that that's still, I mean, it's a good find there. So do you have plans to make it public, the stuff you guys are doing? You're always welcome to come work at Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no, I look at it 10 times a day. I mean, I, I never. <laughs> you look at it all day long as you work here. <laughs> um, we don't have any immediate plans to make it public at this time. All right, thanks. Those kinds of frameworks tend to be very specialized to a particular culture and, and way. So, I mean, just to give a little more detail about that, I mean, like, um, part of the problem with, like, Facebook working with different projects is that we, so a lot of times we face problems that nobody else cares about, right? Like, how many, how many companies here care about having multi-data center replication uh, for high partitions? I mean, there, there's but, a handful. But multi is not three. Uh, it, it's a dozen or something. It or could more. be, well, we don't, yeah. yeah. Some number, uh, some <laughs> um, I mean, not, not that many people care. So we, when we proposed in Hive, I don't think there was a lot of excitement, for instance, in the open source community about, about features like this, um, which makes it hard. So like, we'll start adding things in here and there. People are like, why are you doing this? And we'll be like, well, we need it. And nobody else does, unfortunately. Uh, that situation may be changing today, so maybe people will be more open to those ideas. But um, this, is, this, is, this is that question that makes the moderator the speaker. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. All right. Um, my name is Nilesh, and um, I'm a data scientist at a company called Shopcake. And uh, my question is more about pipelines and the way we way we do from end to end all the stuff that we want to do in terms of recommending and so on. So when I first started, um, I used to write MapReduce jobs. Um, then uh, you probably uh, look at the data, use R or scikit-learn or something like that, and somehow deploy it. Um, then we started using Hive. Um, then we started using Pig, and I've been through a couple of companies. And so the way I see is it, it if you are doing um, serious stuff with all the infrastructure and everything involved, it takes two to three years to get a st stable ETL a pipeline where you can actually start doing something uh, serious. And, in, and, and that's such a short uh, time in terms of the new tools that keep coming. Um, and so now there's Spark, there's MLLive, and, uh, and, and empirically you guys have shown that, hey, we can do the same thing now in probably, ten, uh, in, 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 uh, you get 10x the speed. And the amount of engineering involved and getting the architects and getting the system and getting the company again to move over, um, it, it is, uh, I mean, it, it's, so I mean, how, how, what is the good way to kind of, um, to move into tools as well as uh, things like H2O and so on and so forth without ha having to abandoning all that work that you have done um, because there is incentive to move, but it's, it's, it's still difficult. This is one of the reasons that so many companies get started in Silicon Valley. It's because up until recently, the only way to upgrade Hadoop was to start a new company. And uh, <laughs> I think that's a major force for uh, entrepreneurialism here, is, no. is the attraction of a new tool set. <laughs> I, I think in this case, though, um, just as a reparty, fall riff off of the last question that that Avery had. Hardware change, right? So memory has really dropped in cost, right? So it's actually now possible to get uh, a terabyte memory without spending really a fortune, and that was not true even five years ago, right? Or if it was, there was no software to take advantage of it. So I think one of the big changes, if you if you will, I mean, of course. Uh, Hadoop ecosystem has gotten more and more robust in some sense. Now you actually have mature tools and it has matured. But I think what happened is the inflection point of cheap memory. 
And so if you think about Spark or H2O, these are really, I mean, they're not GPUs, but they're banking on this more robust commodity called memory and cheaper memory, and that's where you're getting the 10x or 100x boost. And uh, if you build your pipelines, I think the next phase is the in-memory uh, kind of revolution is here. Yeah, so my, my question is basically, you know, I have to train data scientists. I have to have engineers working with me, and I have like this big pipeline. It's not just, it's not data or it's not tools, but I have to move. Humans are the slowest to move. And I have to move now this organization to now train, retrain people and get moving them in a direction. And somehow that is where I feel that I'm seeing a lot of bottleneck in terms of, okay, if I'm starting a company afresh, I'll go with the best tools that are out there. But now I have, let's say, you know, the comp complete ETL designed in Pig and I'm using, let's say, Java UDFs and using Mahout or whatever it is now to switch completely to Spark and start using ML Live. Uh, you know, the, 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 the CEO will come to me and say, well, is this really necessary? Uh, many people have seen this problem for many times. And the Spark solution is we try to make your life easier by just provide uh, different APIs. For example, for Spark SQL, uh, Spark SQL is try to be compatible with HiveQL. That means uh, you can just uh, copy your Hive scripts to Spark, and it, it will run on top of Spark. You also use the same meta store. That's fine. And then if you talk about you are familiar with R, and you can also use Spark R package, and you just use the same L apply, and then apply on a sequence of data. But now it's on a distributed data set instead of a local data set. And also, it's, for example, is uh, for I'm only but we also want to provide different language in APIs like Python API and uh, Java API just to make people comfortable to change. And if uh, there are also other efforts, for example, there are some uh, peak, peak on top of Spark, so you can run your peak scripts and also have on Spark, I think. Yeah. So you're saying I should start using Spark? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Just uh, don't don't worry about uh, the migration to yeah, Spark. Yeah. We will because try it's to... it's a lot of this code is not just writing code from an analytics uh, analytics perspective. It has been code reviewed. It has been. I mean, you've gone through that en entire software engineering cycle, yes. which mm -hmm. is a non-trivial cycle, and then you start. You say that hey, you provide those APIs. That's true. Mm -hmm. But as long as if you have to re rewrite the code, then then it's not trivial. Right. Is is are you seeing uh, a reason to move because it's slow, or are you seeing if you're happy, there is no reason no, to there move. Is, right? There is a reason to move because I, I want to move. It's probably faster. I can right. get more tools and so on and so right. forth. Right? So I, th I think that's the real justification, but, right? But so. The question is slightly different. You said you see a reason to move. Can you quantify what would be the benefit of you moving, including everything, the training and all that's involved? Can you say why, if it takes six that, months that is, in order that, to do that, can you come up with, you know, I'm kind of playing no, no, this I, dollar I, I, thing. I, right. But can you actually do the analysis? And that is the question. I mean, how do I do it until I start and implement it and so on and so forth, right? So it's... You have to go to the microphone so we can hear. Yeah, go, go, go you over need there. To be you need to go and, to the and microphone. As you walk over, uh, go, on, go on over to the yeah. microphone. Uh, you didn't say please. Please. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just giving command. I don't say please. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 but, no, the, but the, not the microphone. You the the really video recording me. can't hear you. Yes. So uh, there are methods for doing this, and the key to it is you have to budget for play. You have to budget 5%, 10% of budget for every, you know, when you're grown up, you call it R&D. But in reality, it's playing. You have to try new tools. You have to try them out. You have to waste time. And you have to try implementing these. Somebody says, oh, it's completely API compatible. Try it. And if it is, great. If it's not, you can now quantify those numbers. But you have to apply some amount of dollars to decreasing the uncertainty of those things. Because it is an uncertain world. And you don't, can't believe everything about every new technology that comes out. You have to try it and see what's real. You're at the microphone now. We so I think you said it, but earlier on, Avery also indicated that at some point they forked the code. So Hadoop or big data is right now still a moving target. No matter any which way you look at it, it's a moving target. From a company's perspective, you have to look at it, and I think you just said it a moment ago, 
you have to look at the ROI and see if you really need to change. If you really need to change, use the existing one, use the fork that Avery was talking about, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the new thing. It may have improvements, but that's your decision. <laughs> um, while I'm here, actually, there's one thing I wanted to comment. A lot of you said things which I agreed about, um, but I have to say, I do not work for NVIDIA. However, those are two parallel universes. The GPU is actually a progression that they have done very well, and that's the reason why Intel was always interested. Uh, I won't say any more beyond that, but uh, the parallel, uh, the interface between those parallel universes has not taken place, and that's the reason why I would not give NVIDIA any bad name, because the CUDA actually works in many, many ways, and it is a progression from the CPU. Uh, another thing, one thing I wanted to say was... Can, can you... Say your name and... Oh, my name is Sunil. I'm in a stealth mode startup, but... So, one thing that I wanted to point out was um, use an analogy of a snowflake. And a lot of you said things about an elephant. I would call it the elephant in the room. So at this point, a lot of the complexity needs to be hidden under a simple, uh, very elegant interface, which is yet still a moving target. And I think if you use snowflakes, snowflakes, if you look under microscopes, are nothing else but fractals. But if you look at multiple of them, it's beautiful the way the fractals look. So that's the scalable part. But anyway, I, I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Sunil. Hi, my name is Danny Wen, and I'm from. Yeah. Hi, I'm from Chuild. Um Shri, if you remember Topher, and he wants to say hi to you. Um, so um, I actually Ted, I like your speak. It's so cool. <laughs> actually, my fat question is for Nikrom. Uh, so um, will you talk about the? Uh, am I am I pronounced right? The Hebrew, right? The Hebrew. Okay. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so you sh show us the picture. You have SQL Server, the SSI, and no, the Hadoop SQL one. Server, not by long shot. <laughs> Teradata and Hadoop, not SQL Server. Well, you have. Well, your picture has SQL Server left hind and the Hadoop SQL, right. SQL. SQL, not SQL Server. Oh, not SQL Server. Okay. That so, was Teradata cluster. Thank Careful. You. This thank you for the clarification. Agitated. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So my question. He's explosive. Yeah. My question is related to uh, real-time analytics, and yes. I want to know, you know how you solve that problem, because y you probably have transaction uh, running on yes. a relational database, right? And you yes. have H2O on Hadoop, and you have some ETL translate between two. And, and how you solve the real-time, you, you, if you someone doing transaction on the re relational database, mm -hmm. how you, you know, get real-time analytics result right away? Okay. Well, what I talked about was the back end was the warehouses and you know Hadoop and and uh, Teradata warehouses? This is the back end. They are not in real time. Although you can do real time on Hadoop, for example, if you want to query not Hadoop, I'm sorry, on Teradata, they have a, a way by which if you want to get like a single product, you go. It's called one C one amp query. You get it right there, sub second. You can do that on there. But this is in query in real time, and both Hadoop and, and uh, not Hadoop, both PayPal and eBay have quite a few other servers you might imagine that are between <laughs> the front end and the, um, and the warehouse that enable you to do real time analysis of transaction, etc. Yes, I didn't cover everything, I just gave a few examples. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, I will talk to you offline about sure. our solution. Of course. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was trying to nominally, uh, my name is Subra uh, with Stanford in Cyber Knowledge. I was trying to nominally reconcile Nahum's statement with which I you know, spiritually agree to some extent based on experience, which is that if you have a good model, then that's better than just throwing stuff and stirring and seeing if a cat or a dog pops out. Judgment. I said this is the fact, and if you get something good out of the soup, as in identifying cats or looking at something and identifying everybody by name by noting this in real time, face recognition, good enough for me. I mean, that's uh, I like. I mean, this is my preference. I yeah. like things. I yeah. grew up on what's known as statistical communication, information theory. You're the theorem. 
and you know you base things on solid ground. But if things come from, you know, experimentation or you know, empirical, good enough for me. It's the result and, that count, in my opinion. And is Ted's interpretation of do stupid things is that putting stuff in the soup and? No, they're not. They're, no, they're, they're not. I, I, no, no, I think, I, I, I think stupid. I, I, I want to speak the first one in the world that speak for Ted. Oh. Okay. <laughs> First, oh. <laughs> no, no, but no, no, speak for you interpret that. My point is, I think what he meant in stupid are simple, transactionally simple. simple. Yes. So yes. you don't do a vectorized integral in closed loop on every line of code, but you count things. You look at NLP, most of it is just counting a lot of things. Okay, so those are, I think, simple. I, I don't think you meant stupid. Stupid is something you do that doesn't give you any results, but I think you meant... Stupid is something that makes people laugh. <laughs> but it oh, means okay. simple, yeah. 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 Simple. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, it, but a second slightly different question is... Uh, a theory behind that, too, yeah. because you can quantify what these simple things do, and you can understand what they do, and so you can now understand what's going to happen when you do ten times as much of those. Whereas the very hypothetical idea that you might spend a few more weeks analyzing a small bit of data and maybe get a good result is much less certain. And so in some sense, the do more stupid stuff, do more simple stuff, does actually have a simpler theory behind it and makes him happy from that standpoint as well because it's understandable and predictable. And you can, and, you and can the law of large, right. the law of large numbers, right? There's the theory, The law yes. of large numbers makes Gaussian actually a Gaussian space, right? So, so you can right. actually get something but, from that. Yeah, uh, so quick but, follow But the mean on. temperature of human blood, for example, was calculated in 1900. And it was calculated, and what we were taught at schools was never calculated most af after. Because the mean is not going to change after you do a million samples, more or less. And so there, so there's some limitations to the simple stuff as well. So it's not just pure simple. So, so there's some limitations to that. That's kind of where a little bit of data science does help your analysis. Right. Uh, I did have a second question, but a quick follow-on to the first one is that have you had any experience, if you need to sort of debug as to what went wrong, uh, as to how tricky or not that is in the deep learning context? Because I mean, if a peacock pops out instead of a cat, and it's important to figure out why. Uh, is that an issue that has been problematic with the deep learning applications? It's problematic in every large system. No. These things right. are big and complicated. We, we have kind of the world's current leading expert of deep learning back at the audience, um, right. Arno. Um, he could probably answer the question more. But yes. the, the deep learning system can jump back and forth. It's converging, then it's diverging. You can have high accuracy, and suddenly, it, after a few epochs, it goes back. So right. you see, I mean, you the, see the, that uh, instability initially and over time. And sometimes, you come back to a local minima where you're not, no longer getting out of that hill. So, so there, there are, play, it can pop up uh, a Schrodinger's cat, not the real cat, right? The one you yes. can't find. Um, okay. But, but, but uh, I guess it's a, this hyperparameter hyper search that kind of can be applied, so you can come up with some interesting mechanisms. There's a lot being learned as we speak about this algorithm. Right. So we can take that off offline. The second quick question was: uh, you, you were talking about user interfaces, and R was good. So do you have a sense of how R compares with, say, the, the Azure ML sort of uh, interfaces? Wise? Which we, I, I didn't uh, know. Microsoft has Azure. 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 Microsoft's uh, their, their GUI interface to machine learning, which. So I've seen a little of the Azure ML. Um, can't speak more about it than having used it for a few hours. Um, R definitely has community. So the, the beauty about R is as professors are teaching or, pro, or people are graduating, like one of the, one of the PhD students who's um, recently come to, to help us, she wrote her PhD in ensembles, and she wrote subsemble, the algo, to basically quickly put together and run it in, um, in R. And so now we can look at that as a, as a way to improve our own algo and improve our 
plug it into the same kind of mechanism. So it has community. I think the biggest difference um, that has changed, if, if you think about um, the 80s, 90s, 2000, and now, I think the biggest change that has happened is code without community is not interesting. Um, it's become very, very much um, a risky effort for people to jump on some code base which doesn't yet have a body of users. Now, Azure ML is special because it may be plugged into Excel spreadsheets and suddenly get all the Excel users. So over time, it may, it may end up becoming a very large, um, widely used platform. But at the moment, I mean, Mahout has, has, has users. R has tremendous amount of users. Scikit Pandas has users. So I think, uh, and, and MLlib is gaining users. H2O has users. I think what's happening is that when you brew community, you, 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 you kind of have this Linus Torvalds effect of with enough people watching your code, all bugs can be fixed. So. Just one more comment to this. And I think I don't want to give the impression that only R or only Python, everything. I think multilingual is the way to go. And this help also in the developer, etc. A few years back when I used to write MapReduce in streaming, I used to write the mapper in Python and the reducer in R because I like better the text analysis in Python. And I like to go, to go and get the data frame and do whatever I want in R and run whatever model I want back in the reducer. So I mean, you have to be agile, pun intended. And so the point is you don't want to get, as, as a per your question, et cetera, when you get the people, you don't want to people to be so narrow-minded. Oh, I know I have only this type of hammer, so I can hit only this type of nails. You have to be multilingual and to be able to go between different environments. So when you need to write SQL, you write SQL. You need to write something with Python, go for it. You need to do great analytics and interactive modeling. I like R for that matter. So it depends on what you want to do. So another thing is uh, when you consider uh, this, uh, for example, Azure ML as a candidate for machine learning tasks, you need to think about how well it plays with others, especially in this Hadoop ecosystem, inside this Hadoop ecosystem, right? So you need to think about how you connect it to your ETL pipeline or feature transformation pipeline, and then connect to Azure ML and how to get the recommendation out and serve them in, in, your, in your pipeline. That's also another concern with when you select machine learning products. I'm sure Microsoft will be willing to help with that. They, they do have to. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The last brief question. Hi, Sorry. thank you. Um, quick question for the whole panel. I am wondering uh, how critical is the uh, ETL in the whole pipeline? Or what, what percentage is it? Uh, I want um, to know from every single one of you the percentage number so that I can do a yeah, machine la uh, learning on that, from that. Um, I'm really looking for it. By order, just go ahead. Give a number, he has 4%. OK, 80%. 80? Yeah. I think I agree, 80%, yeah. yeah. There about, I, can, I want to say 82 and 0.35%, <laughs> but I like no, to please say precision please. and accuracy. The point is, if you consider the ETL along with all the data managing and the organization and getting the data in the right format to train, then 80 plus percent, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I would have gone even more. I would have said 90 plus percent. Uh, but I would probably draw the machine learning part just around the machine learning algorithm itself. And I tend to deploy in non-machine learning sort of settings like on a, a search engine. And so. For me, the machine learning part is really quite small. So is this number, excuse me, sorry, one second. So is this number uh, uh, from E, T, to L, right? Not eh. after that. I just it's want to know till L stop it, um, loading. It, it, it's all one syllable, and ETL doesn't make sense in the machine learning pipeline. Uh, you do stuff, and then you do a little bit of machine learning, and then you do stuff to deploy it. And extract, transform, load, those are data warehouse concepts that right. don't really necessarily apply in modern pipelines. Uh, if you have Kafka running SAMSA pipelines in continuous form, there's no extract, there's no transform, there's no load. It's all pipeline. But it's, you could draw the line, here's the machine learning part, here's the part before, here's the part after. And I contend the part in the little circle there is 10% or less in my experience. 
Sri. I think uh, ETL is definitely a substantial portion, right? So there's a new, I mean, of course, 65 to 80 is kind of the number I've heard consistently from across most of our customer base. Um, we're seeing new trends, right? Feature extraction has become more of a machine learning piece. So you, people are now applying machine learning in this ETML almost and come up with newer ways to not spend that much time. So how do you kind of now do the wrangling piece? We see some of the startups in the, in the Bay Area doing focus on that. So apply some newer techniques, word to work, another machine learning technique applied to, to transformations before you can run machine learning. I think you, you will see that every time uh, optimization, I mean, if you move the bottlenecks from one to the other, we'll see that machine learning will be now applied to cut that problem down because we're using SQL and joins all along, and that's big join pieces, and finding new data sets and, and orchestrating new data sets or, or even um, coming up with newer techniques. All of that is now uh, going to be revisited because that's actually still a big bottleneck. I think you'll also you. see a difference. Uh, mature companies with existing pipelines are going to be spending less time building those, and so they're going to get to spend more as a fraction of time on the machine learning part. Uh, I'm typically a little startup company kind of guy, and so we're building the pipelines, learning what data the people might exhibit to us, and so I think my number is going to be canted higher as part of that, because that building of the pipelines is part of my cost. True company, it's true that, uh, that the infrastructure is more uh, stable, but you always get new data and you always get new problems in order to cut the data in different ways, which calls for different, you want to call it ETL, different data preparation for it. And you get new data bugs. Absolutely. Yes. Not to leave the audience with an ETL uh, thought at the end of a machine learning con um, talk, just want to pepper it back to kind of, pivot it back to kind of where machine learning is headed, right? I mean, as you see, the, the deeper, uh, deeper mechanisms get, the more intelligent systems get, I think we will actually face um, real competition. Do you need a fourth panelist or fifth panelist who's actually a machine learning algorithm? Um, I think that these are going to be where we'll see machine learning like not just be part of our life, but also dominate our lives. And so there is this new boundaries that are coming to form between us and humans and machines and kind of what do, what do we foresee in the next, not so far our future, where data will be driving humans, not, it's not data-driven applications. We're going to be more and more in that space where, where um, machine learning is going to actually try and compete with humans. Could you train Watson to be one of the panelists? <laughs> I'm sure but, IBM but, is working on it. Except but, they wouldn't but, answer any questions, they would just ask questions. <laughs> With, with that thought, uh, I, I think we could continue all night. And uh, in fact, there's enough topics for a few discussions. So I'd like to thank this great set of panelists. And I'm sure you agree with me. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Pashu is going to do a photo opportunity. If you notice, the coolest guy so far is Ted. So now everyone can look cool. <laughs> thank you. So just a couple announcements. Um, uh, Alistair Kroll from O'Reilly is going to be uh, speaking at the Hive. And those of you who are interested in starting companies, this is uh, uh, applying analytics to startups. And then Pashu has a few announcements. Yeah, I would really like to thank uh, Nicole, Tarun, Natasha, Pranyam, and the AV team. They are all LinkedIn employees who have... Uh, stayed later tonight after work. So thank you for hosting us tonight. And uh, thank you. <laughs> and yeah, see you next week on Thursday. And the video recording of this event will be available. And I'll post it online so you can share it with wh anyone who couldn't attend. Thanks.